Good morning. Well, Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are holy and awesome. And we pray that this day we would see afresh with wonder uh, the glorious things that Jesus Christ has done for us to bring us near to you. We pray this in his name. Amen. It's a dangerous thing to belong to a holy God. Uh, in, my, in my readings in, in the morning, at the moment I've been reading the book of Joshua. And at the end of Joshua, I've been struck in the story about how God's people are about to renew the covenant that they have with God. And uh, Joshua is like warning them not to. He, he, he's like saying to them, guys, do you really want to do this? Because God is awesome and holy and, and you're not really able to serve God and he's holy and he's a jealous God and he won't forget your sin and your rebellion. And, and he's, he's basically saying if you provoke God by sinning, his holy anger will make an end of you because it's a dangerous thing to belong to a holy God. Or at least it was for Israel. Because as God's people in the church of Jesus Christ, even though we're sinners and we live in a sinful world, today we're going to worship together by trusting in the fact that we shelter from God's holy anger at sin behind the sacrifice of our perfect King, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to rejoice because Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. And while he is there, we can safely belong to and serve and worship our holy God without fear. Well, do you agree with this statement? Human beings have a great ability to minimize the wretchedness of our spiritual state. Uh, we think a lot more highly of ourselves, morally, ethically, spiritually, than we should. But God doesn't. He sees us as we really are. And the, the state of our world is anything but holy. When you watch the news at night, when you look at it on your phone, you know, does holiness spring to mind? It's anything but holy, and this provokes God's anger, his holy anger. And it's always been like this. We see it again and again in the story of the Bible. And we see it once again in our passage this morning, the final chapter of Second Samuel. Uh, we're going to look at all of chapter 24. Uh, if you want to follow along, it starts on page 234. And in this final chapter, verse 1 begins like this. It says, again, the anger of the Lord burned, burned against Israel. And he incited David against them, saying, go and take a census of Israel and Judah. So we're not told exactly why God is angry once again with his people, but it's a pretty safe bet that he's angry at the way they live, uh, at their sin themselves, and the sin of their society has made together. And because of his anger at their sin, God allows King David to be incited to take a census, to count, to count everyone in the country. And so David gets Joab, the, the commander of the army, to, to travel around the entire nation and count everybody. And this is what God has incited him to do. What, what's the big deal about David taking a census? Well, well underneath what's happening here lies the same problem that plagues our world and our time and our city of Melbourne. It's a rejection of God's authority and a vain grasping for self-reliance apart from God. Or in other words, sin. Uh, th this census at the start of this chapter, it's not, it's not what the Australian Bureau of Statistics makes us do every five years. Um, it, it's different. Th there's only two reasons a king wants to take a census in the ancient world. And that's either to raise an army or to raise taxes. To do both, you need a good count of all the working-aged men in the country. And more so, 
In Israel, God's, God's nation, God's kingdom, when a census was to be taken, the country, every, every person in the country was supposed to bring an offering to God uh, when the census happened as a way of recognizing where power and authority actually lied, not, not in the king and not in the state, but with God. Uh, Moses commanded this to Israel. In, in Exodus, he says to them, when you take a census of the people of Israel, each shall give a ransom for his life, bring an offering, uh, to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. So David's taken a census, but in doing so, Israel and David haven't brought this offering and they've ignored God. Uh, By taking a census, David's trying to be self-sufficient as a king. Uh, We've been going through 2 Samuel together for the last few weeks. You think he would have learned by now, but yet again, David is disregarding God and, you know, doing things apart from him and his law. And, and so David, he, he's the king, he's, he's God's anointed king over Israel, the nation, but he's led Israel into this great sin. And more so because God is holy and demands holiness, particularly from his king, but also from his nation, David's led them into great danger. How are you with God? Could God, are you good with God? Or could God be angry with you? We don't often think uh, in Australia as, as, as God, of, God is angry. We, we kind of think that he's, he's good with us. He loves us. He's, he's, he's with us. What, you know, why wouldn't God be good with us? We, we kind of, we, in our culture, we default to thinking of ourselves as good people and, and God is pleased with us. You know, we, we, we say things to ourselves like, you know, I support my family, I, I'm on the rosters at church, I, I help out at school, I help out at the, the footy club, I, you know, I gave money to that humanitarian cause. Once I bumped into a car in the parking lot, but I left a note. You know, so I'm a good person. Me and God, we're good. But when God has spoken to humanity, has that what he's been saying to us? This isn't how God thinks. This isn't how God views our world. The the Bible assesses the moral standard of our lives pretty bluntly in the book of Romans. It says, all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. It says, none of us are perfectly holy. And thus all of us somehow have to make good with God. Or one day we'll face his holy anger. Uh, Well, as we've seen in the book of 2 Samuel, as we've been going through it together, uh, King David, uh, he's a great man, but he's also a great sinner. Uh, But he's also a man after God's own heart. And when he does sin... He's someone who's quick to admit it and to repent of his faults. And so in in this last chapter of 2 Samuel, in verse 10, we read uh, after the census that David was conscious stricken after he counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant, for I have done a very foolish thing. God heard David's prayer, and he sent him a prophet, the prophet Gad. And God, uh, through through Gad, offered David a choice of three punishments for his sin. Uh, Israel could either face three years of famine, uh, three more years, sorry, three months of uh, civil war, or three days of plague. Uh, But David, he doesn't really choose from any of these options. He, He just simply appeals to God's mercy. Uh, He says in verse 14, uh, David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall into the hands of men. 
So is that enough? When you sin, like David did, you know, to confess, to ask for forgiveness, is that enough? Is, is David and the nation of Israel now good with God? No. God's judgment against sin is very real. Confession and, and repentance and asking for, for, for forgiveness by itself is not enough to shelter us from God's holy anger. It's a step in the right direction. But really, it's like trying to fight a bushfire with a garden hose. It's not enough. And so God still sends upon Israel the punishment that is promised in the law for taking a census without first humbly acknowledging him. And so we read in verse 15, the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated and 70,000 people from Dan to Bathsheba died. It's a dangerous thing to belong to a holy God. Just as light and dark in the physical universe can't coexist, neither can spiritual light and spiritual darkness coexist. The light destroys the darkness. If we honestly examine our, our hearts, our lives, uh, our society, which we have all together built and are part of, if we examine these things and we find any imperfection, you know, anger, gossip, dishonesty, addiction, lust, you know, failure to honour God and his goodness and his righteousness, even just a hint, then we're not fit to stand in the holy presence of God. And drawing near to God becomes dangerous. This last story in the book of Second Samuel, it, it reminds us of this, this sobering fact. We're not as good as we think we are. And God's judgment on sin is real. But it also gives us, as Christians, hope. Because in it, once again, we, we see not only God's holiness, but we see his heart. And his heart is full of compassion. Uh, let me read from verse 16. Uh, when the angel who was bringing the plague stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity. And he said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So the plague has come upon Israel and it's, it's moving to the capital city, Jerusalem. And at the last moment, God's heart is grieved by this destruction. As necessary and as just as it was, he's, he, he's grieved and, and he's compelled to make a way for his sinful people to be safely near him and, and to find a way to shelter those he loves, both David and you. Shelter them from the wrath of his holy anger. And so the Lord relented from destroying his people and their sin because of the intercession and sacrifice of his anointed king. So the, pray, the plague is coming towards Jerusalem, and, and King David has not been idle. He, he's run up onto the hill above Jerusalem, to the north of the city. And there on that hill above the city, God's kind of let him see into the spiritual and, and see what's really happening behind the plague. And, and, he, and he's seen this, this awesome and terrible angel of destruction, which, which is behind the plague, and you know, bringing God's judgment upon Israel. 
And, and seeing the angel coming towards the city, he, he throws himself in between the angel and Jerusalem and, and, and puts himself in the path of God's anger. Uh, verse 17. When David saw the angel, he was striking down the people. That, that's what's spiritually happening here. He said to the Lord, I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall upon me and my family. Picture this in your mind. David standing on top of this hill with, with this terrible angel of destruction before him. And behind him is the city of Jerusalem you know, and full of people. And David's on his knees, interceding with God for the lives of all the people. And, and David pleads with God, let your hand fall upon me and my family. And God in his grace responds again by sending the prophet Gad to David. We read, Gad went to David and he said to him, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. And so God, in response to David's prayer and his intercession, he's prompted King David to make a sacrifice to shelter his people from the consequences of their sin so that the, the animals that are sacrificed will take their place and they will be destroyed and not the people of Jerusalem. And so David hurries up to Aruna, who owns the hill, and he tells him what's going on, and Aruna's like, just, just take everything, just stop the plague. But David insists that the full price for the land and the sacrificial animals will fall upon him and him alone. And Aruna agrees. And so we read in the very last verse of this book, verse 25, so David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered prayer in behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. Do you realize how awesome and significant this moment is? David prayed on the hill, let your hand fall upon me and my family. Or, or more literally in the Hebrew, let your hand fall upon my house, you know, my dynasty, my house. And when God looked down on David and heard this prayer and answered yes, God knew that, that he himself, God, would have to pay the price of this request in a way that David could never have imagined. David thinks that it's him, that it's he who's offering everything to save his people from, from God's holy anger at their sin. But David has no idea of the true cost, the awesome and terrible cost of what he's really asking. I remember a few weeks ago when, when Reese preached on what is the most important chapter in the Old Testament, uh, chapter 7 of Second, Second Samuel, when, when God promised to David, he said, I will establish a house for you. And then in a prophecy foretelling the Lord Jesus Christ, he promised to David that his throne and, and, and the kingdom of one of David's descendants, who would also be called God's son, would be established forever. His house would be established. And now David asks, let your hand fall upon my house. And God says, yes. So the Lord relented from destroying Israel at this threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite, which is the exact place where the temple of God would be built a few years later. 
And it's the exact place where, where the sacrifice, the sacrificial system of the temple, the sacrifice for sin would be instituted. Kind of a temporary solution so that the problem of God's people's sin could be dealt away with so that they could safely draw near to him and, and, and live amongst a holy God. But that was just a temporary solution. And to fully answer David's prayer, God had to come down and dwell with us on earth himself in the person of his son, the person of King David's greater son, Jesus Christ, as the only human being who has ever lived perfectly holy, lived without sin, And Jesus came to his own, to his people. He taught in that temple's courtyards, but he was rejected and he was killed on the cross to answer David's prayer. Let your hand fall upon me and my family. When that happened, when Jesus was crucified, in the physical, he was on the cross, but in the spiritual he entered into the heavenly temple of which just a copy was made on that hill above Jerusalem. And in the perfect temple, Jesus, the perfect king of God's people, made the perfect sacrifice for our sin. As it says in Hebrews chapter 9, Christ didn't enter the heavenly temple by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood and thus obtaining an eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. But how much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. King Jesus was able to do what we and even King David could not do in our own strength to make atonement for our sin, atonement for our sin that's demanded by the holiness of God. On that hill of Aruna the Jebusite, when God said yes to King David's prayer, on, on the place where the temple would be built, he, he knew that ultimately in King Jesus, he himself would pay the cost one day in the heavenly temple. To, to make a way and a shelter to, for his people, his sinful people, to be brought safely into his holiness. But he said yes gladly because of his great love for you. And this intercession and sacrifice of Christ our King, it, it transforms us. And it, it transforms our repentance and our asking for forgiveness. So that when when we, the humble Christian who has faith in Jesus Christ, when, when we ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus, because of that sacrifice that we, we shelter behind, our, our prayer becomes powerful enough to make us acceptable to God in his perfect holiness. It's as if the, the bushfire of God's holy anger against sin which we once stood before with just a garden hose, is now met with the flood of Christ's righteousness to make us safe to be in God's presence now and forever. So friends, let us rejoice that, that we can shelter behind the sacrifice of Christ our King. And now in, in, in our daily repentance to sin, Jesus will renew us and strengthen us to, to, grow us, to grow us in holiness, to grow us in him. So that we, we don't just need to 
now shelter behind him, but we can even start to walk beside him. And, and finally, on that last day, when, when God's judgment will come to the earth, we will be able to stand before him, confidence in his holiness and glory because of the sacrifice of Christ. When you are convicted that you are not perfectly holy and the world that we together have made is not perfectly holy, remember that you shelter behind the sacrifice of your perfect king, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross because he loves you to make you holy. Amen.